Greetings and welcome back to Another Perspectives. I know it's been a while. Today, my esteemed guest is Kazra. He's his own channel. And uh, he is a Persian-American or an Iranian-American, however you want to term it. His uh, other codename is, of course, Darius the Great. And uh, I think the best way of starting this would be asking you know, what his channel is about, uh, what kind of ideas he talks about, what are his views. And then we'll launch into the nitty-gritty about... Uh, I guess uh, you can call the relationship between the United States and and Iran or Persia. But anyway, welcome. Thank you for joining me. And uh, so, what what exactly would you describe your your worldview as, and, and what's your channel about? Well, thanks for having me on. I'm glad to be here. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is Kazra, and I have a channel called Kazra TV because I couldn't really come up with a better name. So, <laughs> um, essentially, the purpose behind the channel. Um, was kind of a budding interest in politics that I got uh, around the time of the November election, the presidential election in the United States. And prior to that, I had I had discovered some uh, traditionalist thinkers, reactionary thinkers, such as Julius Evola and Rene Guénon. And from there, I, I, I discovered the alt-right, uh, as it is kind of known in the United States. But also, I, I expanded out into areas like neo-reaction, and I'd say the broader dissident right, and so if I was to describe myself, I would say that my interests politically and metapolitically and philosophically, broadly speaking, are aligned with the dissident right. And I kind of have a foot both in neo-reaction or the reactosphere, as well as in the more practical aspects of the alt-right, uh, insofar as I, I, do, I am somewhat concerned with things like mass immigration, uh, demographic replacement of places, particularly in Western Europe and the United States, for example, um, and so my channel, it's very much a work in progress and it, it's undergoing changes constantly. Uh, recently I've taken up, uh, interviewing or having discussions with various members of the alt-right or the dissident right community and essentially asking them, you know, what their motivations were in getting into the community and kind of des describing their stories of how they, how they got involved with this kind of sphere. Uh, and also making shorter videos where I just, um, I just discuss kind of uh, kind of trains of thought that I've had, ideas that I've had regarding, broadly speaking, anything concerned with the dissident right. Um, but yeah. So what what a uh, and always there'll be a bit of overlap with your interview with Rashan X. I'll probably put a link to that in the low bar as well as your channels. Um, what uh, what interested you? I mean, you say this sort of took up. It, it, you took this up with regards to YouTube in November. Um, but you mentioned uh, Evlo, who is an uh, interesting Italian thinker, a bit of an oddball, as well as uh, Guignon, Guignon, who is a bit of a kind of esoteric guy. Uh, um, but, I mean, clearly there's a background to all of this. So why did the reactosphere originally become uh, interesting to you? I mean, did you... Uh, <laughs> you grow up in the United States the, uh, these days, and... There's a kind of uh, very milquetoast prescribed uh, uh, sense of politics that you, you just sort of toe the line. Usually, uh, at best, you'll have sort of Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal. But I think few people gravitate to something like the reactosphere. So what's the background behind that? Well, I'd say that I was fortunate insofar as, although I was born in the United States, I wasn't really affected with the same kind of... Uh, uh, what you might call white guilt or the sense that, you know, it, that, that I was privileged in some way for having been born there. Uh, because, of course, I was I'm the very first person in my family to have been born uh, outside of Iran, as far as I'm aware. Um, and so I, I viewed myself very much as as a migrant or as the as a part of a migrant family. So I viewed myself as an outsider. And so I thought that despite this, I, I witnessed that, you know, my parents were doing, they were working hard and they were doing well for themselves. And I, so I was never affected with this sense that, uh, you know, my race or my migrant status sort of predisposed me to being unsuccessful or oppressed in any way. So I had a bit of a, I, I was a bit more, I was a bit outside of the bubble of the standard kind of, um, you know, Democrat Republican view of things. Uh, I, I would say that I started out very much as a libertarian. So I was still more or less immersed in this kind of culture of hedonism and individualism and, and materialism and so on, um, basically just out to get mine and do whatever I had to do to, to be happy, so to speak. 
Um, but I was very much uh, thinking of that in terms of if I worked hard, I would be able to achieve whatever I wanted. So I, I, there was nothing really in my mind making me, holding me back in terms of sort of modern liberal precepts uh, like social justice and things of this sort. And they never affected me. So I was already kind of maybe further right uh, to start with than most other people. Um, and eventually I, I, you know, I picked up the social justice culture around me. You know, I would be on Facebook and I'd see people making paragraph long posts about how, how terrible it must be to be born as an African American because you're constantly disprivileged and they would never really, you know, it'd be kind of a vague, you know, it was like a, it was an, assu- it was an assumption really that, uh, certain ethnic groups were just automatically disprivileged. And interestingly, I was kind of included in that group because I'm, you know, I, I look, I'm, I would consider myself white. I have fairly pale skin. Um, and I, of course, as an Iranian, you know, we refer to ourselves as Aryans. That is what the word Iran means, land of the Aryans. But, um, people I think viewed me as sort of a vaguely ethnic person, sort of a, you know, <laughs> an uncertain person from somewhere in the Middle East or the Caucasus somewhere. But, uh, you know, you know, I, I kind of was able to play that, uh, foreigner card or minority card, despite the fact that I, I wasn't really, um, I didn't fully think of myself as one of, say, amongst the African American or the Hispanic community. I, I saw, I saw myself fitting in more with, uh, white kids, Asian kids. Um, in your talk, uh, actually, with uh, expat, you, you mentioned sort of the, the classes you attended. Um, there was a, a dearth of minorities there, which is you know, understandable. And the more advanced ones, uh, I mean, there was mostly just white and East Asians uh, or, mm-hmm. or Indians as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, you're in your 20s, yes? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, there's one thing I always have to observe is that a lot of this just... Uh, we were just sort of privately discussing. I was discussing how uh, the inability to, to criticize the Israeli or the Jewish lobby actually had picked up a lot of steam in the 80s. And it really, uh, the whole social justice thing, you know, it's been present for decades, but in the United States in particular, I, I don't remember growing up. Uh, and I, I grew up in, in New York, which is, you know, a, you know, a left-wing hellhole. Um experiencing this constant talk about, you know, race this and race that. Uh, it's very strange, and I think it's definitely picked up steam in your generation. Now, having said all that, having you having said all that, I have an interesting qu- question to pose to you. Uh, I hope it doesn't throw you off too much, but um, given the fact that you are the first son of a first generation, quote-unquote, American, whatever that means, uh, what do you feel your personal connection is to the American Revolutionary War of 1775? <laughs> Very little, if yeah. any. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose my view of that is similar to my view of the French Revolution or the Enlightenment, broadly speaking, in that um, I might, as, as I got into, and I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll get into this as I kind of close off this uh, bit of my sort of history, um, but essentially... Eventually, I, I was exposed to the alt-right and through a friend of mine who sent me a link to something called the Iron Pill Comics, which is a sort of, um, you know, one of these image board, uh, you know, pill memes like red pill, blue pill, green pill, etc. And uh, through that, you know, this is a comic that espouses a lot of essentially alt-right ideas. Um, and the, And this character in these comics holds a copy of this book that if you'd recognize the cover, it's like a yellow and black diamond cover, which is, of course, Ride the Tiger by Julius Evola. And I was curious, so I looked into it. I read the book. And from there, um, I picked up a lot of... I was immediately interested in Evola's perspective. I saw him as a man with great scorn for the plebeians and, and sort of a very noble and aristocratic attitude, which was contrary to essentially anything you'd see in the West, which is always a sort of apologetic, um, you know, the poor Africans, we must care for them at all costs and we shouldn't. It's a very, it's a very, um, in Nietzsche's terms, I suppose you'd say it's a sort of almost slave morality. I know that not everyone might uh, appreciate the master slave dynamic that Nietzsche lays out, but it, that was something that had I had read about pre, prior to this. And that was also something sitting in the back of my mind, the idea that, uh, strength and nobility and sort of a masculine virtue 
was something good, which was not very much appreciated in the West. And so through this this history that uh, this history of of mine of sort of being somewhat of a contrarian and opposing this what I perceived as a sort of weak and effete culture, uh, I, I took to Evola immediately. And from there, um, well, I got into the the react the reactionary ideas of uh, well, the French Revolution being essentially a sign of decay and degeneration, where uh, old structures that had been around for millennia uh, were discarded, and you know belief systems and values that had propelled human civilization for a long time were were uh, discarded to make way for this uh, wonderful progress of of science and humanism and things of this sort. Um, but of course, the revolution, the French Revolution specifically, was a uh, sort of a, a bloodbath, a massacre that um, I would look at perhaps as inevitable uh, given the context. I mean, it was probably something that had a series of events leading up to it, a series of, of uh, shifts in human consciousness perhaps that made it inevitable, but which nonetheless is a, is a sign of decay uh, and a warning for things to come in the future. And I'd view the American Revolution as falling in line very much with that, the idea that it's almost an arrogant idea that uh, that man has taken control of his own destiny. Um, the American, it's very much the American ethos, I think, that uh, man has taken control of his life. God is no longer, you know, man has risen to the level of the gods and can control things through technology and science. And so there's no need for these uh, prior hierarchies or belief systems. We can just sort of. Uh, we can take take charge of the world and take control of things and bring them into our own hands. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to slightly disagree. I mean, with the American, in regards to the American Revolution, <clears throat> there, uh, I mean, the United States was fairly functional uh, for a while and and deeply religious. I mean, there, the whole reason behind, uh, some, well, not the revolution proper, but you know, people fleeing the United States was certainly practice. Uh, some aspects of Christianity, Puritanism, what have you. Uh, the French Revolution, yeah, that was significantly less successful. But I guess the reason why I had asked that question was, yeah, I, I am uh, in, well, at least paternally, a first-generation American, too. But uh, it, to illustrate the point that, you know, the term American means, in my humble view, almost nothing. Um, because what you have, and when people describe themselves, when I hear these terms these days, you know, Iranian American, Mexican American, Black American, uh, Irish American, Hispanic American, Jewish American, Chinese American, in this endless, there are probably at least three dozen of them, maybe four, maybe five. I don't, I don't really know. And the fact that everyone needs to put a qualifying adjective of nationality or ethnicity or race before that tells me a whole lot, meaning specifically that why insert the American there at all? I mean, unless you mean by American, you happen to have been fortuitously born in that part of the world and you have a passport, okay. Um, but at least even even in, in, in on the left wing, there's a pretense that being American means something more than merely having a passport. An American passport, although I would argue it, it doesn't mean anything apart from that, um, because they, and, and I have to argue as well. I have a friend who maternally can actually trace his maternal ancestors back to the Mayflower. Uh, believe it or mm. not, he still he doesn't feel any connection to the Revolutionary <laughs> War. So whatever it used to used to mean, I wasn't alive at the time. American is uh, the term American. Being American is, means absolutely nothing, and I think. You would probably concede that to you, the United States is just a comfortable place to live, right? Yes, um, I think it's very telling that, for example, when a somebody from Mexico uh, crosses the border illegally or legally, and they sort of settle in the United States for a couple of years, they have they have the access to to call themselves a Mexican American, even if they don't speak the language, even if they don't have any knowledge of the history of the country. It's really, it's very apparent that all you really have to do to be able to append American to your name uh, is to physically be located in yeah. the country. Yeah. So it's, I would agree with what you said. Yeah, and the only common, I mean, if you want to call it culture, but the only common cultural thread, really are the fast food, drive through restaurants, uh, fancy beverages, hot beverages, like orange chocolate lattes or whatever. I mean, it, this is... And so 
I just don't, I, I feel like, well, I haven't lived in the United States in a long time. But even when I was growing up, I mean, it, it was certainly uh, incipient, this feeling. But still, there was still the pretense of, of studying early American history intensely. One would pledge allegiance. Did you go through those sort of rituals of pledging allegiance and singing the anthem and what have you? Yes, in school, of course. Yeah, yeah. And okay, so that's so it better. was it was strange to me, and it is strange to me now looking back that we, we did pledge allegiance uh, to the flag. And, of course, the, the nation was under God which seemed a, almost almost um, a strange kind of uh, kind of throwback to older times. It really didn't seem like there was any role of God or religion the, in anyone's lives. That's a, a late interpolation, I believe, from the 50s. Uh, so mm -hmm. basically, and you see this on the coins as well, what happened was during the, um, the, uh, the communist scare uh, during the 50s and, and the 60s as well, I think it happened during the 50s, uh, government officials took it upon themselves to sort of insert uh, the deity's name on, uh, on various <laughs> coins and, and, and bills. And I believe it entered into the uh, the Pledge of Allegiance as well, just to sort of separate out uh, the, the the pious or allegedly pious nature of the United States from the the uh, the atheistic uh, communist uh, regimes. But um, yeah, I, I, I believe that's the history of that. It had, I, I, in fact, if you look at coins printed in the twenties and, and or printed uh, coin, minted in the twenties mm -hmm. and thirties, you won't you won't see that. Um, it really was a kind of a, that particular aspect of things. But even even without the God aspect, the the thread of this sort of American experience. I mean, this is one thing I have to really uh, remark on that. Um, there used to be a, a drive, uh, with a few exceptions, um, for many Americans uh, to, I suppose, reject or throw off their quote-unquote former identities, to essentially assimilate and become Americans. Now, this wasn't done perfectly, and there were many struggles. Um, you know, the Irish took a very long time. Um, the Jews still haven't really assimilated, and, uh, well, with... There, I don't know how many dozens of different Latino identities exist these days in the United States, but there probably are dozens. Uh, but uh, there, there used to be a kind of desire to sort of throw that off, to, to, to move towards a kind of uniform American identity, which is difficult, admittedly, to define. Uh, but the fact, that, once again, that <coughs> you have to insert this sort of national or ethnic or racial adjective in front of, of, of everything, Armenian Americans, there's another one that came to mind thinking of, uh, the young turds and a Kasparian. This, um, I, I just people people often on my channel for years. I mean, well, what do you have against the United States? I don't really have anything against it, but it's just this sort of formless mass of nothingness. And I think anyone who's a who, I, I guess it's because you come from a quote unquote ethnic sort of background. You have a you know you're deeply enmeshed in Iranian culture. At least your parents have been. I come from a European background. My father. Uh, well, he was born and grew up in Hungary. Uh, at least as a part of his childhood, I, you know, I, I can't really see this this American experience as anything other than a very commercial one. The kind of thing you see everywhere these days. So the American experience effectively is not anything unique anymore, to my mind, uh, because you know you, you can get uh, fancy me phones in Germany or in the Netherlands or uh, really anywhere these days. You don't have the fancy beverages necessarily. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure that'll come in time in Europe, but uh, it's just this—you know—there's there, no pressure, and that's the other thing. There's no pressure to sort of reject the former. Now, uh, people would argue, well, you know, you, you don't want—I guess people on the left would say—you you don't want to uh, you know, give up your former identity. It's, it's important, blah blah blah. I suppose, but if the American experience is supposed to be something unique. Uh, and something that uh, really defines you as, as differenti differentiated from, from groups outside of the United States, I think that's an, an important aspect. Now, sure, you know, most of us grow up with some variety of American English, but it really is just, it's just a, it's a completely hollow and empty term. And I think this is a re another reason why the alt-light and, I guess, more like libertarian types, uh, they really struggle to combat things on the left because... You can talk about you know, American values, but American value—what does that even mean? I, I don't really think it means anything apart from this 
commercial modernized uh, uh, you know exchange of, of of goods pretty much uh, in my view i mean did you ever get a sense of something uniquely cultural culturally american where you grew up as you know it made you feel i guess wedded to it or at least you know attached to it i would say none whatsoever uh in that especially for having grown up in an area with a very large uh well, in, at least in my schools, there were a large number of Indians, East Asians, and of course Hispanics. But in, in the classes that I was in, I mean, it, it was they, they, white kids were essentially outnumbered in many of those classes by you know various Asian ethnicities. Um, so there was really nothing at all. I had no sense that I was in a particularly unique land, or that I that I was even in in, a, in somebody's land. It really felt more like just kind of an open blank slate. On which, uh, you know, we just, you know, we did what we had to do to get by in life, but there was nothing, uh, nothing beyond sort of the economic motives. Uh, one of the, one of the thoughts that I've had regarding this sort of, uh, lack of a defined identity in America is that if, if the United States was ever to, and this is sort of something that people don't take seriously because the United States is so militarily powerful, uh, it's outside of the scope of any other country really at this point. But if the United States was to weaken and other regions of the world were to become stronger, let's say hypothetically there was a war between the United States and Mexico, mm. that would be that would be extremely strange because you have such a massive Mexican or quote unquote Mexican American population in the United States that you would have to wonder where their allegiances would go. Oh, yeah. I mean, we had this. We had these problems with, say, Japanese Americans during World War II. And Jewish Americans with regards to Israel. Mm. But, of uh, course, those populations were much smaller, yeah. and we're not dealing with the uh, you know, tens of millions uh, who could theoretically turn on the country in a situation where you know, their loyalties would be divided. And there's no effort to make their loyalties focus on this country. There's oh, really... Absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> No. Yes, I'm sure most most migrants, I'm sure, have stronger loyalties and connections to their home countries. So yeah. I don't really see yeah. the U.S. as being very stable in that regard. Other than, I mean, you look at, um, I mean, if you look at the history of the 20th century, the uh, the various ethnic minorities that, that came over, um, look at the Irish. I mean, at, at first, yes, there was a kind of you know a, a sort of eth ethnocentrism present, but over time, it became very attenuated and, and very few. Certainly, during, even during the mid 20s, and very few Irish uh, Americans, at least whose ancestors uh, went back a few generations, had a, an attachment to Ireland proper, or felt that they needed to get involved in uh, the conflict in Northern Ireland politically, or even have a terrible uh, interest in that. Uh, and yeah, I mean, there, I mean, it shows you the diff, the shift in in attitude in the United States when, rightly or wrongly, I won't uh, say it's good or bad in this context, but when when Japanese Americans were interred. Uh, for reasons of security, even though I, I would, I think it's safe to assume that many of them, if not most of them, are probably completely innocent. Um, but the kind of attitude one had uh, towards these things, and you're right. I mean, the the, the Mexican, in particular, the Mexican American population, if you want, to, the Mexican population rather, has ballooned uh, in the United States. And uh, yeah, it, it is a, a very interesting question uh, that. Um, that, that one can uh, can pose, although arguably, and I, this is something I, a sentiment that that reactionary expat echoed in one of his videos a while back. Uh, that I think in regards to, to Anzac Day, uh, but anyway, um, if if he were called upon to sort of fight for Australia, he probably wouldn't do it because there's not much worthy to to fight for, and we have to. I mean, you look at the military commitment these days that tends to be one that comes about uh, as a rule. I mean, there's, there are exceptions, obviously, but many times because people are born into poor circumstances, get out of that way, you can get out that way, it helps you uh, in terms of uh, employment uh, as well as education later down the line. Um, but the country is, the United States is, is beyond divided. And, you know, looking back, it, it's... Yeah, I am. I'm an oddball. I, I I I remember watching in New York City all these different ethnic groups do their own thing, and always not not being part of that, um, just because I'm weird. Um, and then arriving at university and then seeing all these groups, 
of people, the, the various student unions, you know, the Chinese Student Union, the Latino Student Union. I never really understood it at the time. I, I why are all these people doing this? <laughs> And, uh, yeah, but it, even then, this was in the 90s, mid-90s, mid-late 90s, it, it, things have, have, have gotten even worse in this regard, uh, such that, they, and I, I don't think, this is actually a serious issue, because without a, a common thread to unite American identity, um, you get what we have now, and it's becoming worse and worse. All, these, all the factionalism, these, these people... Uh, it's it's very difficult to unite under any particular banner, uh, so they just sort of almost willy-nilly gravitate to one or the other because there's no common American identity anymore. There's nothing that uh, there's no tie that binds. Uh, there's not even a pretense of that in the '80s. There was still a pretense of that. That seems to have largely disappeared in my observation. Although I have not lived consistently in the United States in many many years, but this, but you of course experience this from the internet and YouTube, and you catch wind of this, uh, and and so, yeah, I think this is a very troubling thing uh, in the sense that uh, it has allowed in many ways the rise of very strange uh, philosophies. Because what happens, of course, when people have no common identity, oftentimes there are exceptions, is they. Uh, they look for a new one, so they must find it in social justice or some strange bohemian form of politics. And indeed, many people gravitate to the alt-right because there is no, I mean, they, for their own reasons. People tend to either go left or right. Um, but, yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, I think it's been very destructive, ultimately, because it's just, it's, you feel a connection to just to nothing whenever it's just a passport um and i'm sure there are plenty of people particularly on the left that would lie about this. oh they feel deeply american it would but i doubt any of them could define it and that's the important thing they, could, they might say that but what does that even mean i think one of the most uh, telling signs in regards to this is the imagery that the left uses in america for example um there was the women's march or something like this where they had hijabs with the american flag printed on it which is utterly mean it makes no sense at all no, um no. and also you'd see protests or rallies or marches uh against trump shortly after he was elected and you'd see these these masses of people marching in the streets waving all different kinds of flags mexican flags argentinian flags i don't know flags from all around the world but no american no united states flags and it's just this kind of amusing thing that that people really they're, they're <laughs> they they will proudly stand behind a mixed banner of all different representations of different countries around the world other than their own, uh, which I think shows, it proves this point that the American identity is hopelessly fragmented at this point. Well, I think fragmented is being both euphemistic and, yeah. <laughs> and generous. I think it just doesn't exist. I mean, like I said, you, you could, could consider <clears throat> the American style of consumerism, which has been exported to every corner of the globe, a kind of cultural identity. Um, but I don't think it's a very fulfilling one, um, and um, I think this is one of the reasons why we've seen these, like I said, this, well, it's, it, it, there are many different branches, but essentially a bifurcation uh, of some people gravitating to the far left and others in various uh, right-wing directions, uh, and whether it's alt-light or alt-right or reactive sphere or whatever. Um, but I see that I've, I've just seen that no good has uh, has ever come of it. Uh, you know, the like I said, the real shift I think took I think took place in the 90s uh, because there was still some pretense uh, otherwise in the 80s when I if I think back on it. But um, of course I can't comment on other places in the United States outside of uh, New York City or New York State. Um, and certainly places in New England that I had visited very often as a child and, and run the American flag. Um, and the connection to those events. Um, even in that, you know, there was still talk of sort of our history and you know, a meaningless term for, you know, the son of an immigrant and a meaningless term for many people who had been born uh, the children of immigrants, but still it's sort of our history. Whereas I, I don't think you could, I mean, you could nominally... Uh, use a phrase such as our history to describe American history. 
Um, but I think a response wouldn't be, I don't know, uh, the American Revolution the, or the Declaration of Independence. It certainly wouldn't be the Naturalization Act of 1790. <laughs> uh, so it would be something like, yes, our history, the uh, the cornucopia of, of of colors we see everywhere, and the, the you know every people from all over the globe importing their delicious cuisine. I, I don't know. That's why I'd say I, I can't really. People, I mean, people are still curious why I, I, I'm kind of. I find the United States distasteful. This is one of the major reasons. I just there's nothing there. It's just a big space, empty space or not so empty space, where you buy lots of stuff. And Europe, I will say, it's becoming that quite fast as well. Anyway, uh, there's if you're familiar with Jonathan Bowden, he's a British orator yeah, who's. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've uh, I reference him quite often and. One of the things that he had repeatedly mentioned in his various speeches is that there were different paths that America could have taken, and it, it went down its current path of sort of globalist consumerism. But there was another sort of American identity that that was genuine and, and truly American in a unique way, which was the sort of rustic frontiersman, self-sustaining, individualistic, out on the out in the elements, the countryman type of uh, attitude, uh, which is perhaps uh, encapsulated by a series like Little House on the Prairie, yeah, uh, and I and this this sort of uh, this sort of um, ethos does exist still in some areas, per- particularly in rural areas of the United States, where people are still sort of removed from the uh, the hustle and bustle of the cities. Mm. They're still very much, at least to an extent, uh, isolated or rural. Um, you might you'll see this somewhat in the South, perhaps in the Midwest, but uh, it is it Montana, is uh, maybe. Yes, yes. It's interesting you bring up Little House and Prairie. I, I grew up watching that on occasion. <laughs> I, I don't think you could run a show like that and get any views these days. <laughs> well, television's dying anyway, but uh, that sort of thing. Uh, it's just, it's, it wouldn't be of any interest to you. I agree with that. Um, and in the many ways, and perhaps I'm virtually certain of this, I think this kind of disintegration of a common American thread is, is just a... Unfortunately, an organic process that is occurring across the globe right now, and probably an unstoppable one. Uh, it doesn't mean that I, I particularly like it, but I have to acknowledge that it, it, in some sense, probably was an inevitability. In those areas that have not yet been touched, they will be uh, eventually. Um, and and uh, that is, in many ways, lamentable. Um, but I guess the real question uh, is how, particularly in the United States, but also elsewhere, um, how, how does one live in, in that kind of world? Because my view is that many of the, the desire for identity, a kind of particular identity, whether it's American or white European or Iranian, whatever it might be, in the aftermath of all of that, uh, tends to be very artificial at best. But by that, I mean you almost have to whisper in your own ear to convince yourself of of X. And I think identity is, I mean, I'm not denying that some people, an identity can be felt. Some people might feel that in their their heart of hearts or in their metaphorical souls. But the idea of coming to identity out of a pool, a sort of empty uh, abyss lacking anything uh, resembling that, uh, merely because one is searching I think that almost lacks authenticity, if you see what I'm saying. That, um, you know, I, I, you know, dream one day of going back to Hungary. Will I ever feel particularly hungry? I don't think I will. Even if I were to master the language, which I think is also doubtful. But I don't think, I, because it's gone. Whatever, whatever might have been is now gone, and it can never be recreated or retrieved. And I think, this is my own view, my pessimistic view, that even if one seeks out uh, an identity that is uh, relevant to oneself, whatever one's ancestry might be, that uh, that this is uh, essentially a lost cause because it's predicated on an artificial search, uh, which itself is predicated on on, on something that was never there in the first place. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think um, this is where a view, perhaps a cyclical view of history, a Spenglerian view, where you see that the, the birth and the rise and the eventual death of a civilization is inevitable. And in this case, it seems to have affected essentially all civilizations around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and perhaps there's some prospect that uh, after all of you know the current global empire collapses, 
there may be room, there may be an, a new space opened up for ide- new identities to emerge that are genuine and uh, perhaps that derive some sort of authentic, uh, some strain of authenticity from prior forms that were there before them. But in the current climate, insofar as everyone is, insofar as the world is connected, and global, and uh, fully sort of capitalized, every you know square inch of land is capitalized on and entered into a, a global marketplace such that uh, everything is, uh, as Gwenon would put it, um, the reign of, this is the reign of quantity, where all values, all distinctions, all qualities are, are leveled down to a, a number so that they are, in, they are exchangeable with one another. Everything is made fungible. Yeah. And so you have some unit of you know, Hungarian culture, some piece of pottery, for example, and you value that in, in relative to a piece of American Indian culture and you, 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 know, you buy and sell them. So uh, really, I think the only prospect for a true reemergence of authentic identities uh, would would demand that this sort of global marketplace dynamic uh, disappears. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's an excellent point, uh, namely that uh, the the quantifiable everything has become, in terms financial terms, monetary terms, quantifiable, uh, fungible. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some you own some book, uh, and it, it has X value, even though it might have some connection to some piece of history, maybe your own, your family's, whatever. Um, but yeah, and, and I think that's why uh, we are sort of writhing in the tentacles of, 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 of an unstoppable force, which is sort of this global economy that doesn't really allow for any authentic identity apart from an individual one, but even there, I mean, I know the alt-right takes umbrage at, you know, sort of individualism, but I do think there's a validity to individual. It's just not the sort that's propagated today or, or, or even spoken of. I mean, the the individual uh, that, the individual that, that one speaks of is not the rugged individualism uh, of, of the days of yore, of, of, of times bygone, where an individual is individual or particular characteristics uh, unique to him. Uh, the particular qualities that are only as- ascribable to, to, to his personhood, but rather the individual of mass conformity. So everybody drinks the fancy colored fruit lattes, and I mean that's regard that's effectively it's collectivist individualism. It's not a uh, it's not a, a quirkiness uh, of of a, of a particular personhood, and I think. Uh, that's another consequence that, in my view, the, the kind of globalized economy or the globalism, if you want to call it that, hasn't only annihilated sort of group identity, it's annihilated an individual identity. Because everyone who is a normie and blue-pilled on, on most matters seeks to conform to the status quo, uh, which is you know, you're, you are, yes, you are an individual, but you're an individual and you have to do X, Y, Z. You know, you have to buy this product and drink this beverage and, and go to this restaurant and listen to this music. Uh, it's it, it's another, once again, another hollow, empty thing. And so this is, this is a kind of funny confluence of ideas because I'm not alt-right, but I lament, the alt-right might loss, lament the loss of group identity. I lament that to some degree. I, I lament far more the loss of individual identity because it just doesn't really mm. exist anymore. You don't really meet genuine people these days very much. They tend to be carbon copies of each other, uh, and that's boring as all hell. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So uh, yeah, and I do think there's a a cyclical view uh, of history that can be taken here, um, and uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to ride this out. I think I don't see uh, a workaround or a, a solution to this. Now, there's some people that think this is just fine. Um, I think it's it's very regrettable uh, on on for a number of reasons that I've cited, but uh, ultimately not nothing not much can be uh, done about it. Uh, so uh, you know, and, and and this is why I don't have much hope in in anything. Uh, you know, whether it's the manosphere, or the reactosphere, or the alt right, uh, the alt light. Now, the outlight is perhaps the worst of it all because they're so blue pilled, at least nominally blue pilled, on so many issues. They won't, they won't address certain things. 
they won't address uh, sex differences, genetic population differences, uh, which are probably the two most important things you can possibly address in the context of a society or a civilization. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, I think it's looking pretty grim. I'm, I'm known for being fairly blackpilled, but I, I just, you know, I think both group identity and individual identity has been annihilated by uh, the trends of globalism. Uh, and yeah, I, I, certainly there, there, there's a, a striving, certainly amongst the youth, to return to at least group identity, less so individual identity. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's. I, I think ultimately it will probably fail because it's it's artificial, and 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 it's it, a bit, and to make an analogy here, it's a bit like um, a bunch of people in a rowboat. Uh, <laughs> Up against a, a tidal wave, you know, hundreds of feet tall, mm. and they're going to be swept up in it. I mean, it, it's a nice idea, and there's something to be lauded in that kind of, in, in sort of bravely railing against the uh, that almost unstoppable force of nature, but uh, one that ultimately is going to end tragically. Uh, Albert Camus is he? There's a quote by him in which he says that all things can be conquered with scorn. And uh, that's something which I kind of fall back on any time I start to become black-pilled. In that, and I feel that's essentially the Evelyn position of riding the tiger, is um, grappling with modernity, the sort of unstoppable tidal wave of forces that you're, you're facing, um, just grappling with it as best as you can, putting up a brave front, putting up whatever kind of resistance you can, but ultimately recognizing that uh, in practical terms you may not succeed, you probably won't succeed, but uh, you can still place yourself above it in some sense by having scorn for it, by having disdain for the situation. Well, I, I don't disagree. I have a great deal of scorn and disdain for it. I'm, I'm also uh, <laughs> profoundly misanthropic. <laughs> that that sustains me as well. But it's uh, it, it you know I I, ha I was um I was actually talking with a friend earlier today and was a bit down and he was asking me why and said well you know just <laughs> look around you. I go through cycles of, of sort of being a bit more down than, than I otherwise would be looking at the global stage and, and just humanity more generally. But yeah, I think uh, some score and a, a, uh, yeah, a kind of, um, kind of vigorous resistance uh, to certain things. And, and a distaste for it can be nourishing uh, to the self uh, in a way that other things uh, cannot. I mean, there's I found no sustainment or nourishment in any of the uh, the modern things on offer, other than some of the advances made in science. But I, I would say that those are detached from the the kind of commercialized consumerist culture that is basically the world culture. Uh, now, now we've talked exten uh, reasonably extensively about the uh, uh, lacrimose uh, lack of American identity. Now, that isn't necessarily true in a place such as Persia or Iran, as it's called sometimes. Um, Iran, I mean, a lot of this you discussed at length with the reactionary expat, but Iran has an ancient history. It is... Uh, Rashner said this too, but I agree. It's, it's a sort of tragic history. It's uh, a history that of uh, a people that uh, I guess lost their identity to a very alien one that they've retained yet uh, sort of kept at arm's length in many ways. And um, more recently, uh, we, we were just talking about the Shah earlier. Now. I'm curious, I guess my first question is how you would regard American-Iranian relations, particularly because when we say that, essentially we're talking about Israeli-Iranian relations because mm. Israel is pulling the strings, not in every regard, but certainly in regards to this particular uh, political, geopolitical issue. Uh, do, do, you, do you think that there, uh, there's a kind of neutrality? Is it a hostility? I mean, how would you describe the situation right now? Well, just for a moment, uh, just to give a bit of trivia here, um, because this is a question that I think a lot of people are uncertain about whether it, is, it should be called Iran or Persia. And there are a lot of Iranians, 
I prefer the term Iran simply because it's the more uh, ancient term, okay. uh, which was ultimately what the people referred to themselves as. The empire was known as Iran Shah or the, the Aryan Empire or the land of the Aryans or uh, various other permutations on that. Um, and Persia was used by the ancient Greeks to refer to re- to refer to the same empire. Persia uh, was, of course, only the Persians are one ethnic group, one tribe amongst several within the Iranian Empire. But the Greeks used the term to refer to the entire empire. And that has become the uh, sort of standard Western term to refer to modern day Iran. Interestingly, a lot of uh, diaspora Iranians actually have turned around on this and actually prefer the word Persian because it doesn't have the connotation of sort of the Islamic state of Iran. And it, it harkens back in a weird way. They use the word Persian to harken back the to Armenian an older Empire, and ancient. By Cyrus. Yeah. Right. It's a, it's a strange, it's strange how it's kind of turned around, but uh, I'm turning it around once more and, and returning to the ancient term of Iran. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yes. Now, regarding uh, American-Iranian relationship, um, it's it's a little bit unsettling. The, ex- the the kind of rhetoric that I see in the West, even even by people like Donald Trump, uh, the current administration in the United States, viewing Iran as at least publicly kind of treating Iran as though it's it's the ultimate evil state, along with I suppose North Korea uh, and Russia to an extent, which is interesting because of course Iran. <coughs> Despite the constant allegations of state-sponsored terror, uh, most of this is within the region, and it's mostly sort of infighting between different segments of the Islamic population. Um, and there is very little, if any, Shia Muslim terror uh, or attacks outside of the region. So as far as I'm aware, there has not been a single Shia Muslim perpetrated terror attack in Europe or the United States for for perhaps as as far as I remember, as far as I have looked into, um, certainly... Right. In, it seems to be uniformly Sunni. I think. Right. So it's very strange to me that Iran is always... They, they always point the finger at Iran as though it's, uh, it's a it's major threat to the West. And, of course, the Israeli connection with the United States and the West uh, can perhaps explain some of this. The way that Jason Giorgiani, who is a uh, sort of a figure in the alt-right, although I, he's certainly... I wouldn't really characterize him as alt-right. He's sort of doing his own thing, and he's sort of a modernist and a progressivist, but he is he's kind of gotten tied into this movement. Um, the way he puts it is that essentially Iran is the direct competition to Israel for sort of hegemony over the region for various reasons, um, perhaps due to the population uh, of Iranians. In, in any case, he puts it as though, and I tend to agree that Iran, if if Israel was not Israel in the West, uh, was not exerting some influence in the region, Iran would probably naturally exert. It would be the hegemon of the Middle East, um, and so it, for that reason, for purely geopolitical reasons, I think Iran is um, is at odds with the West. Uh, although I'm, I'm not an expert on the geopolitics, certainly of the region. But this is my perspective on it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, um, I guess my basic question is, where, where do you think the, the Israeli hostilities come from towards Iran? I'm not actually sure. Um, again, I, I, I suspect that there is... Uh, it's actually interesting that, you know, looking back at Iranian history, you had um, a large population of, of Jewish Jews in Babylon... Uh, rescued and allowed to settle in in Isfahan in, in modern day Iran. Um, so in some sense, historically, the Iranian Empire has been rather generous towards Jews, and I'm not sure that there really ever was a deep seated hostility that could be traced back to the origins of the empire. Um, I suspect again that this is mostly a modern sort of geopolitical tension. Um, Yes, I'm. I'm sorry, I can't say that much more about the topic. I'm not that familiar with the uh, the history of these, the relationship between these two peoples. Yeah, yeah. Well, I find it puzzling too, um, in particular because of the natural, uh, the, the general greater hostility of, of Sunni Islam uh, towards the West. I wouldn't necessarily consider Israel part of the West, but yeah. 
that generally speaking, when hostilities are projected, um, they uh, they seem to 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 come most, mostly from the Sunnis. I find it really puzzling that Iran should be targeted. Now, on the other hand, um, going back, the sort of Islamic State of Iran, uh, we that did, I mean, we had the Iranian Revolution. Uh, that was very much a reaction uh, to allegedly the abuses of power by the Shah. Uh, well, that, that's what was claimed at the time. But we go even further back. We go to the 1953 Iranian coup by Anglo-American oil. Well, instigated by Anglo-American oil because uh, uh, Mosaddegh. Anglo Anglo-Persian oil. Well, 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 yes. I mean. Oh, I, I understand what you're saying. Sorry, I'm sorry Anglo, I was referring sorry, to Anglo-Iranian, Anglo, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of being facetious here. Ang- technically, right, Anglo, right. the <laughs> Anglo-Iranian oil company is the specific name, but I sort of, right, right. I'm talking about this sort of collusion of, of both right, the right. British and, and American uh, uh, secret uh, secret services uh, being involved in this. Um, and, and, of course, what Mosaddegh wanted to do at the time, and at the time, Iran was pretty progressive and, and sort of modern for you know, 50 standards. Mm-hmm. He wanted to nationalize the oil, and uh, well, the Anglo-Iranian oil company wasn't having it, and Churchill was involved in this, and Eisenhower, and um, they uh, they got rid of him, or the CIA, CIA abetted in it greatly and installed the Shah. Shah was an interesting guy, of course, um, but I suppose uh, I'm not an expert on his period of rule, but uh, you know, ab- abused power. One thing I find interesting is that there seems to have been a well, ever since the 1979 revolution, a, a kind of uh, a, ki- a kind of subtle regret, I guess, uh, of Iranians uh, on the part of Iranians towards the events that. Followed the Iranian, the uh, the Islamic Revolution, um, because it was very retrograde in many ways. Um, in the same sense that the Iraq, the Iraq of today is a far worse Iraq than it was under Saddam in many respects, at least. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's not a perfect analogy, obviously, but the the Iran of the Shah was not necessarily worse than the uh, post-Islamic Revolution. Iran. I'm curious as to your thoughts on that. I would say that there was, there is more than a subtle regret. That there is a very strong regret uh, of the 90, uh, the 79 revolution, uh, amongst essentially all generations of Iranians, especially those who had lived under the Shah. I've spoken to various family members and, and gotten a sense of the through diaspora Iranians as well. I've gotten a sense that, very broadly speaking, the Shah was remembered fondly. Um, even though at the time people would complain about perhaps he he was a bit harsh with his use of power or he was a bit a bit tyrannical, but looking back in retrospect, uh, essentially the '79 revolution is a very interesting case in that despite it being a revolution nominally to strengthen the role of Islam in the Iranian state, it very much backfired. And from an accelerationist or from a from sort of our perspective, if we are to oppose Islam, we could view it as a very positive event. Because the 79 revolution, and we can talk about the coup a little bit in a moment, but um, it was very popular amongst Iranians. People viewed it as a sort of a path to regain a sense of national identity, to re- to look to turn inwards and turn away from the West and the Western powers who were perceived as meddling in Iranian affairs. And so the revolution was seen as a way to take control of the country back in Iranian hands and Islam was part of the Iranian identity, and people just accepted that. I'm not sure how much of a genuine religious fervor there was amongst the people. Uh, I think it might might have been more of a sort of nationalistic or even economically motivated ideology in that people thought if they took control of, say, the natural resources of the country, they would all have an in- improved standard of living. That was the that was that's what my parents relate to me is that. Um, Iranians at the time genuinely felt that the revolution would improve their standard of living and, and increase their liberties and uh, generally you know, enrich their lives. But very quickly they found out that, um, well, immediately you, know, you had all the universities shut down for several years so they could be reprogrammed in proper Islamic doctrine. Uh, you had the standard of living for 
people living, especially particularly in, in urban areas or middle class Iranians, the standard of living went way down. Um, and of course, you had the cultural reforms where women had to start wearing the headdresses or headscarves and could no longer, you know, they had to be more modest and Islamic. They couldn't wear makeup and and things like this. And immediately, I mean, within probably a few years of the revolution, people began to regret it. Uh, there was a rapid turn of um, of attitudes on this. And it, it, one of the interesting barometers by which you can measure the Islamic Islamicity or the Islamic support amongst Iranians, um, which is unique to Iran, is you can you can take a look at what how parents name their children, because there's two categories of names that people receive in Iran. There's either the uh, pre-Islamic uh, Iranian, authentically original Iranian names, and then there's the post-Islamic sort of Arabic names. Uh, such as Muhammad and Ali and Ahmad, uh, which are sort of Arab Muslim names, which many Iranians have. But then there, then you have um, names like my name, Kazra or Kasra. Uh, you have other names like Kurosh, which is the, which is Cyrus, uh, Art, Art, Artemis, Kave, names like this, which are Iranian Persian names, pre-Islamic names, and you can really get a sense of how a person's parents felt towards Islam, how religious they were based on the kinds of names they give their children. And you see more of these Persian pre-Islamic names being given out to this latest generation of Iranians, which I think signals a, uh, a discontent and sort of a turning away from the religion after seeing what a disaster the 79 revolution was. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, would you say the, the, the vast, it's basically the vast majority of people that think this way these days? Um, I, I, this is what I said on reactionary on the interview I did with reactionary expat, and somebody in the comments mentioned that many rural Iranians um, are more supportive of the regime. That in fact the rural areas, the poor areas of Iran, have sub- overwhelming support for the current Islamic regime. And I asked my my parents about this, and they they corroborated this. Uh, so many of the things I speak about will probably only be applicable to. The urban areas, city centers, or moderately wealthy middle class Iranians, uh, and there, the it's it's as you'll see in many other countries, there is a sort of split in culture between the rural areas and the urban areas. Um, but again, I, the reason for this probably has to do with a mixture of the government's efforts to appease uh, poor Iranians to garner their support as a as a sort of base of power, and also out of their sort of their tendency towards being more religious and viewing the clerical authorities as being genuinely uh, important figures just by virtue of having a sort of connection to, to God. Uh, and so there's a certain level of perhaps religiously inspired fear of the authorities that that makes rural Iran uh, somewhat more supportive of the, the Islamic regime. But amongst, certainly amongst urban Iranians, middle class Iranians and diaspora Iranians, there is overwhelming uh, so there is an overwhelming rejection of Islam and a, a hearkening back towards the sort of pre-Islamic Iran. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it should, I imagine it would come as no surprise, but many a revolution is born in an urban center. Uh, it's, it's rarely, mm. it does happen, but the kind of allegiance to the, uh, the, the petty theocracy, I would imagine that is much more palpable to... Uh, peasantry and farmers than it is to uh, urban sophisticates. Mm. So uh, that doesn't really surprise me uh, in the slightest. Um, but what are the real chances of uh, the Iranian people essentially thro- throwing off the shackles of, of their particular uh, version of Islam? I, I see it as being inevitable, but I couldn't put a timeline on it. Just because of the over, the sort of the shift in culture that's been going on. I mean, even if you look back to prior, prior to the 79 revolution, you could already see strong leanings towards a sort of Western liberal democratic function, uh, spearheaded by Mossadegh or Mossadegh, uh, which was, of course, and that, that whole story is a real prime example of how, uh, the West's interest in the Middle East is very clearly not about promoting democracy or liberalism. Uh, and it's very they're clearly it's probably the best example of of why it really is about oil or geopolitics and not about the yeah, wonderful liberal time. values of the West. Um, yeah. So I see I see just just by the sort of cultural shift that I've been seeing and 
And of course, looking at the state of Iran prior to the revolution, it's certainly not out of the question to see a, a turn to you know, liberal values and a returning away from a, perhaps a secularization of the country is not out of the question. And I see it as the, the tensions or the, the sentiments right now in Iran certainly are very much inclined towards achieving that. So I'm, I'm, I can't speak to that, but I, I imagine the, uh, something will have to give way at some point in the near future because there is such overwhelming, certainly urban support for a shift, a turning away from Islam. Yeah, well, I, it's interesting. Uh, I've thought for a very, very long time that uh, American or Western meddling in the Middle East, uh, I can see that Iran isn't really part of the Middle East, but that area of the world, I guess, uh, a better way of putting it, has been ultimately harmful. Uh, in, I mean, I'll put it this way. A, uh, if Iran had turned into a kind of uh, run-of-the-mill, quote-unquote, liberal democracy, I mean, this is not a great thing. I'm not really a fan of democracy, but it certainly would be better than, uh, you know, an Islamic state. Um, you could sort of negotiate with it better. You, you could do more with it, you know. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the, we, we, the, the West gets involved uh, continually and... The, the I guess this was one of the first great examples, the overthrow of Mossadegh for uh, for mercantile reasons, and uh, yeah, there there have been consequences ever since. And I find I, I don't really understand the animosity that Israel bears towards uh, Iran. It could be, as you pointed out, maybe a just kind of issue of who's the hegemon of the re region. I mean, who whoever. Uh, is the is the ultimate hegemon you know determines uh, the ultimate course of things I guess um, and certainly with regards to the United States and the West more generally Israel uh, determines the, the course of things although we have to we have to remain aware that uh, the uh, well at least the, the Gulf the Arabian Gulf states uh, they have uh, they have oil and so the United States has to uh, at least treat with them and you know remain on good terms on some level um, but uh, yeah, the the distinction I think between the Persian and the Arabian, as it were, is, is lost to many a uh, person not uh, coming from uh, that background or either one for that matter. Uh, I think you generally look down upon the the Arabs. Is that not correct? That's a very broadly held uh, Iranian sentiment a you might call it a racist tendency amongst iranians uh and it, it's of course born from the seventh century islamic conquest which per, i think is has lingered in the back of perhaps a sort of collective consciousness or memory ancestral memory of iranians as sort of a humiliating defeat at the hands of a sort of nomadic less civilized less advanced civilization uh in a time of of weakness after decades of battling with uh, byzantine rome to the west um, the at that time the Sasanian or Sasanian Empire uh, was conquered by by the uh, I think it was the Umayyad Caliphate mm. uh, from the Arabian yeah uh, right as far as uh, Iberia yeah right and um, th through that much of the inborn culture of Iran much of the because of course even at that time they viewed themselves or I suppose we viewed ourselves as being in some way superior to the nomadic populations, as many civilized populations always have this tendency, they view nomads as barbarians uh, who have very little culture and they, they tend not to settle down so they don't build great things. Um, so there's always a sort of uh, sense of superiority to those nomadic populations. And and when when Iran was conquered by one of these nomadic populations, there was a sort of res uh, resentment towards them that has persisted to this day. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I... I suppose, I'm trying to think of some analogs in the West. The closest thing I can think of is actually, I mean, it's, it's very residual, but the kind of uh, resentment, uh, resentment that the Celt has towards the, the Anglo-Saxon. But mm. th this, is, this is very muddy because there's been a lot of, I mean, miscegenation now for centuries and centuries. And uh, uh, I mean, ultimately, the Anglo-Saxon uh, achieved cultural hegemony. And the Celt was uh, pushed back. I mean, uh, this is uh, this is uh, 
You know, there's one interesting, I mean, it's a bit of a tangent, but there's one interesting, I, I, I mean, it's actually completely unrelated to Iran, but I, I fear I have to make it nonetheless at this point, that um, there's a kind of a revival in the interest of the Celtic without the kind of animosity that it used to, it used to accompany it in places like Scotland and uh, Wales and, and, and Ireland uh, as well, because uh, you know there, there used to be real resentment towards the English, particularly in Ireland. For uh, they were not the only reason. There was the, the famine, and well, famine was the biggest contributing factor. The destruction of Irish culture and language, but yeah, but that's the closest analog I can really think of um, in the West. I mean, you have small pockets of that. You have uh, you know resentment of some. Uh, minority, but these are minorities, of course. Not a, these aren't like whole countries, really, in most cases. So this mm-hmm. is a fairly unique circumstance. Another uh, example to the Far East could be the the attitude of Han Chinese towards the Manchu and the Mongolians, who mm-hmm. are the nomadic tribes to the north of them. I'm no expert on that region, but uh, I believe that there's a sort of a similar relationship between these these groups of people. Well, I mean, uh, certainly uh, during the uh, the rampaging, the rampages of uh, Attila, sorry, sorry, Genghis Khan. I mean, uh, mm. much of China fell, uh, if not all of it. I'm trying to remember mm. if it was much or not or all, but uh, fell to his uh, his conquest. It was later dissolved, obviously, but um, yeah, I mean, that, I, could, I could definitely understand that. Although. Arguably, the uh, the influence of the Islamic conquest of, of Persia is uh, well, it's much more it's much more longstanding and it, it remains in place today. Right. Uh, and understandably, I could, I could fully grasp why Iranians would resent that. And I would view the the divergence of Shia Islam from Sunni Islam as uh, being at least partly due to the sort of sense of Iranians as being a distinct cultural entity from the surrounding Arab states, uh, and so sort of met, molding the religion that they were forced to adopt into their own in their own way. Not to say that Shia Islam really isn't Islam. It, it's quite similar to Sunni Islam in a lot of ways, and the differences seem somewhat you know, trivial uh, relating to the, how the hadiths are interpreted and such. Um, it's still you know, certainly not uh, enlightened uh, liberal kind of uh, secular type of religion, but it, it is it is distinct. And of course, Shia Islam is heavily concentrated within Iran, and it's certainly it's it could be viewed almost as a uniquely Persian or uniquely Iranian uh, phenomenon. So I think you know I, I've heard it described as, as Shia Islam as a sort of crypto Zoroastrianism, um, which is true in some regards, where you see some Zoro some you know pre-Islamic Zoroastrian holidays and rituals. Uh, still celebrated, um, such as the Persian New Year, Nowruz, which is, of course, based on the Zoroastrian calendar, as well as, and I mentioned this on uh, my talk with reactionary expat, uh, Charshambe Suri, which is a very cl- explicitly a Zoroastrian ritual of jumping over a fire uh, prior to the New Year. And yet and these, these are continued, they are still in practice in Iran today, which is a bit strange considering uh, that they are they're certainly heretical acts uh, to the prevailing religion, and the authorities have made efforts to sort of eradicate these uh, these sort of you know cultural pre-Islamic cultural relics from from the from the country, but they haven't been successful. Which is one of these sort of rays of of light, one of the bright the white pills in this whole thing, uh, which is that some aspects of pre-Islamic Iranian culture have remained very much intact. Do you? Uh... I mean, do you feel very attached to Iranian culture on a personal level? Um, to an extent, not not so much in as you mentioned. It's hard to really authentically be attached to a culture which you haven't been immersed in. Mm. Uh, I mean, I I was born and raised in the United States, and you know, my daily life was very much just standard, you know, American life. Uh, so I I couldn't say that I was authentically immersed in what it means to to grow up in Iran, but I do feel perhaps a symbolic connection, if nothing else, uh, a yearning, maybe a desire to connect with that which exists in Iran. Um, but as you said, it, it is, it's sort of just the best that I can do. It's a sort of abstract connection that isn't really fleshed out in reality. Yeah, I feel the same way towards Hungary. I think a lot of, uh, 
a lot of people uh, feel that way. Well, I mean, the difference, though, I, I suppose, is we're at least being intellectually honest about it. I mean, there are yes. many Americans who, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe their ancestors came from Argentina or wherever, and they, they claim uh, you know, they, they claim some deep connection to that or what have you. But, uh, yeah, I, I think in most cases uh, it's pretty artificial. What, I'm curious, what, how do your parents view Iran? Do they sort of long to return, or are they happy that they uh, they left Iran for the United States? I think as many migrants from the third – well, I, I'm not sure to what extent Iran is really third world. Uh, it, it's standard of – or human development index is uh, – I, I believe it's close to Serbia's. So it's not quite as bad as some of the neighboring regions, but it is, I think, still uh, probably considered to be third world. I think most migrants who find better economic opportunities abroad um, don't really think in terms of their culture. I think they're just happy to have have found a more comfortable place to live. Um, I think you really see that that re resurgence of cultural sentiment in perhaps later generations. Um, but yeah, for them, I think it's mostly just they're just happy to have found a, a way to live more comfortably and provide more resources to their children. Um, although they do still have, you know, I think the, the sort of sentiments, certain certain aspects of Iranian sentiments towards, say, Turks and Arabs, uh, as I mentioned on my talk with expat, uh, many Iranian jokes come at the expense of Turks. Uh, the standard format for an Iranian joke that, you know, like a blonde joke in the West uh, has a Turkish man as the uh, as the uh, you know character in the joke. So anytime you want to portray somebody as making a stupid action or doing something stupid, uh, you, you would say that it was a Turk. Um, why, and so there's, why this attitude towards uh, the Turks, though? I'm not entirely sure. I think it's more it's kind of like a poking fun in a way. I think that Iranians don't really have a genuinely hostile attitude towards Turks. But more of a, uh, you know, like neighboring countries in Europe, I think, tend to do this as well. Neighboring countries all around the world have this tendency of making jokes at the expense of their immediate neighbors. Um, and that's I think that's the sentiment of Iran towards Turkey. They just view them as, as kind of a cousin country that's a little bit less that they look down upon and kind of poke fun at. Whereas their attitudes towards the Arab world is a little bit more serious uh, in that they they have a more genuine, perhaps even hatred of uh, of that sort of culture, um, yeah, I'd say. Well, I, I imagine part of that, and maybe I'm mistaken in this, would to do uh, is to do with the fact that uh, the Turks had received uh, Islam from an outside source, much like the Persians had. Uh, and I mean, they they adopted it obviously eventually, but um, uh, I'm, perhaps I'm mistaken in that, but. Yes, that could be that could contribute to the uh, sort of sh feeling of uh, maybe a, a sort of removed brotherhood of sorts. Well, if in fact the the Persians feel greater resentment resentment or distaste uh, towards Arabs as opposed to Turks, um, yeah, that, I would suspect that might have something to do with it. Um, if anything, the you know, well, yeah, the Turks uh, had once again they received Islam. They didn't. They used to have their own sort of shamanistic uh, traditions back in the day of the various Turkic peoples. Some of them maintain them, um, but uh, because there's so many different Turkic groups. But the, what we know is the Turks who had settled in Anatolia after they after they conquered the remnants of the Byzantine Empire. Yeah, that was uh, a sad day, 1453 <laughs> uh, year rather. Um, I'm trying to remember the day. Kind of escapes me at the moment, but. So I guess in, in, in summary, uh, Iran is the kind of dissident country in the region. In, it has a Shia. It uh, looks to the past in some sense to recreate it. It, uh, it doesn't really like its neighbors very much. Well, that's another odd thing that I just find about this whole Israel-Iranian uh, spat because uh, the Iranians don't like the Saudis very much. But neither do the Israelis, so it's a very odd thing, I think. Yes, it uh, takes credence away from the saying that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, because Iran finds a way to make enemies with everyone around them, uh, even even pe different groups who hate each other. Iran will find a way to get on 
both of their bad sides. Uh, except so the Iran Russians, is, of course. I think uh, yes, they have uh, they have a pretty... friendly terms with the Russians, and and they have some trade arrangements with China, for example. Which is why I mentioned that if Iran was to become integrated into into the broader, you know, like as a global superpower or a competing pole of power with the West, it would likely uh, naturally incline itself towards uh, a lot allying itself with Russia and China, perhaps. Um, and much less likely with, say, Saudi Arabia or uh, other Arab states or Israel. Those would be off the off the books, really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's definitely Saudi Arabia and Israel. Well, probably not. Not. I mean, it's funny though. I, I think it's not going to happen. But I think if um, the United States could free itself of Israeli influence and kind of go its own way, uh, it might make for the possibility of having uh, better relations with with Iran. I think in that case, there would be a great incentive for the U.S. to to be allied with Iran, in fact, given that Iran would be perhaps, a, you know, as I, I think it, a lot of it comes down to geopolitics, uh, local kind of who would be the hegemon of the region, right. largely because Iran is one of the few stable countries with a substantial population and a substantial GDP in the region. And that is, you know, that's kind of a theme we've seen is that uh, one of the things that Israel the Israeli Western kind of coalition likes to do is to prevent stable, strong Middle Eastern states from arising as competitors or perhaps as they would view them as threats in some sense. Uh, and Iran is one of the few remaining uh, gen generally stable political entities in the region, which I think contributes to the Western uh, Western slash Israeli hatred of them or anger towards them. Uh, it is interesting, though, given uh, the reality of the history of American and British intervention in Iran in the 20th century, if, let's assume, Israel had no involvement in this, uh, if the Iranians, in fact, would still be open to that. Because they would be a bit paranoid, understandably so. Yes. Um, one of I, I talked to my parents a bit about this, and they, they helped fill me in a bit on the sort of attitudes of Iranians with regard to the the 53 coup and what happened in the first part of the 20th century. Um, and Iranians, because of the, it was essentially, it was more of a British led, uh, meddling, I should say, yeah. given that they were the first to come and they were, they, it was essentially the British that were profiting off Iranian oil. And interestingly, the United States in some, in some cases tried to get the British to back off a little bit and be a little bit more amicable with the Iranians. For example, the U S uh, had made a 50, 50 profit, sharing agreement with Aramco uh, for Saudi Ara the Saudi Arabian oil company. Um, and so they would help them to extract oil and they would split the profits down the middle. And the UK was very upset at this because it, it set a standard or it set a precedent where they could no longer carry on uh, giving Iran something like 16% of the profit. Um, it's, it kind of set a precedent where people in that region would start to demand more profit. Uh, the, the powers, they would the various countries in that region would want more more money for themselves and the u.s also tried to get britain to back off its various various uh sort of you know punishments of iran for attempting to nationalize its oil by say in blocking its seaports and so uh even though you the history of the first part of the 20th century in iran could be viewed as meddling from the united states and britain through their intelligence services it was more perhaps driven by britain with the U.S. almost as a moderating figure in the in the mix, and so Iranian sentiments towards the British are as the sort of it, Iranian attitudes towards the British are worse than towards Americans. They view the British as these sort of uh, greedy kind of imperialists who want who meddle in their affairs and try to you know steal their oil money, whereas the U.S. is is viewed somewhat less harshly, uh, given the circumstances, given what happened. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, there was a lot of sort of strong arming on the part of the of the British at the time of the United States, and I mean, there was a, obviously they were working working quite closely together, uh, the um, uh, the British and the Americans and Churchill and Eisenhower. But uh, interesting how that, uh, yeah, it's, I wasn't aware that uh, there was that fine of a distinction. The um, way that I've heard it described, hmm. uh, the way I've heard the relationship between the UK and the US described in regards to Iran in the 20th century was that the US and the UK were allies in public, but they were they were at odds in private. So they put up a unified front 
uh, in their sort of discussions and their attitudes to the global community, but they were they had internal struggles with how they wanted to strategically deal with Iran. Yeah, yeah, that uh, that's yeah. Ah, it's just once again just good evidence for why uh, all these people should have never gotten involved. It's. Uh, <laughs> It's been it's been, it's really been nothing but but heartache and and grief and and, and problems uh, for the West ever since. But uh, not just Iran. I mean other places as well. Um, but uh, what do you, I mean? I'm curious though. Uh, on a final note, um, you you mean describe yourself primarily as a reactionary? Uh, this was asked of you, obviously. Someone posed the question to you in the talk. But being that you're not quote unquote white European. Uh, in the in, uh, what is the general reception of of people on the alt right uh, towards you? Well, I was actually very surprised and happy to see the reception that I got in my talk with reactionary expat uh, was overwhelmingly friendly and positive. Hmm. Um, and even people who were perhaps on the fence about you know whether Iranians are are white or not, uh, they were still very open to to listen to me speak and they weren't uh hostile and aggressive and and I, I was kind of honestly a bit surprised but uh very pleasantly surprised and this is this has generally been the reception i've gotten is fairly fairly welcoming fairly positive that even if i am not you know welcome in the alt-right you know uh white european ethno state uh i would still be sort of viewed as a as a as an ally or at least viewed positively for maybe my my contributions um right. On a honorary white person or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. I mean, it would be strange for me to think of myself as an honorary Aryan, given that uh, you know we Iranians explicitly think of themselves as as the no, as no, the I, Aryans. That's why I didn't use the term Aryan. Right, right. Of course, yeah. Uh, right. What a uh, and and the kind of friends you've made in the course of uh, your life, university, school. Uh, how uh, how do they sort of interact with these ideas? Um, well, generally, I, I don't really bring up any sort of contrarian political or ide- you know, philosophical ideas with my normie friends. Mm. Uh, I mostly reserve that for the friends that I've made in the sort of you know reactionary or alt right community. Um, but it, when I you know some of my closer friends that I have had since high school and, and university, um, I do sometimes bring some of this stuff up, and, and a lot of my friends are aware of my channel. Uh, they are aware of my ideas to some extent, and uh, they're they're I think primarily because I don't really push it aggressively on anyone. I'm, I'm not trying to proselytize anyone to the you know white nationalist religion. Uh, I'm not I'm not really pushing anything on anyone. I think I think I just get along with my old friends just fine. Uh, I don't know how they they feel. I think many of them don't really have strong feelings one way or the other about some of these issues. And they prefer to just carry on with the, uh, you know, the American life of, of, uh, you know, getting their qualifications, getting a nice job, making money, and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think they're too concerned with the uh, these kinds of you know, abstract ideas or, or even issues like immigration. Just seem a little bit uh, deta- removed from the day to day concerns of most of those friends that I have. So it's been it's been uneventful, I would say. They they're some of them some of them are actually a little bit open to it. Uh, my closer the closer friends that I have are uh, they kind of they understand where I'm coming from at least it seems. But uh, broadly speaking, there's not there's not really so much of a there's not so much interest I would say amongst the normie friends that I have. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, well. I mean, I, I can't really talk to normies about any of these ideas. <laughs> that's uh, pretty alien. Uh, but I mean. Uh, the interesting thing, of course, is that the internet, for all uh, of the vice that it produces, uh, allows for the connection of individuals that otherwise would not be able to connect uh, with each other outside of these normie circles. So it's uh, a positive, uh, a positive to the many negatives yes, of the internet. Definitely. It's also, you know, there's also Facebook and Twitter <laughs> and all these you know, other inane things, but still, it's. Uh, Quite an interesting thing. I would say the internet is the only thing that has allowed some of these ideas to survive at all, given the reception that, say, oh, yeah. right, you know, far right ideas have in university 
in the sort of you know official really, academic any, any setting. reality basically it's not even, i mean <laughs> this, this it's a strange thing to call you know uh, so in some cases science like genetic population differences or sex differences like that that's far right thinking right right I mean, it, it, <laughs> it's sort of it's true that people on the right are more willing to discuss these things and many of them do it for the sake of agenda rather than objective science mm -hmm. but that, that's i mean that's how far things have gone if you actually consider it because in, in, in some sense, we're, we're labeling mm. uh, a set of data, uh, some information that, that is, is very factual and grounded in reality as, as a sort of politically oriented uh, set of ideas, which is, which is it really isn't, not at, not at heart. Very strange how far things have come, I think. I listened to an interview of Steve Saylor, who is known for his human biodiversity research, and he in an interview he mentioned that HBD to him was not only a science but also something political simply because it had to be political it or it has to be there political, political at this time consequences potentially um, I mean what people will inevitably put it this way I think people will inevitably politicize uh, HBD but uh, well we know that sex differences have been <laughs> politicized so uh, right yeah, people will naturally do this um, I guess it's really a question of what one does with this knowledge and information in the end. Difficult to say. I'm sure everyone has an idea. Um, but one idea that has been thoroughly explored and, and uh, I think thoroughly has failed has been the ignorance, the, the wanton ignorance and, and really active uh, exclusion of the exploration of any of these ideas. The the claims to the contrary, the uh, the denial uh, of the validity of some of these ideas, the denial of the science, frankly speaking. So that's certainly one approach to these ideas. It, it's been a failure in that um, anything that denies reality will uh, eventually implode upon itself. As, as we see a lot of these uh, quixotic left-wing institutional waves and lines of thought doing uh, right now, the... Um, you know, I saw it was not too long ago. I think it was maybe May. You know Charles Murray, who's who's very much he's not even alt light. He's just a conservative, but he he put out this book, The Bell Curve, uh, back in the '90s. Hugely controversial uh, book for no reason whatsoever, but you know, of course <laughs> he got up and he had he I think it was one of some major university in Illinois. I don't remember which one. And he uh, so he gave a speech, and then there was a sort of a counterpoint. Some person uh, of color appeared, uh, offering the the point that you know that all this IQ stuff is nonsense and it's been refuted and blah 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 blah, and his retort was saying, well, okay, he didn't even have a retort because it's so obvious that the science has continued and it's uh, I talked to expat about this recently, but the, the, it's a bit like cloak and dagger. The scientists are pursuing this, they're doing their research, they're continuing with it, but publicly there are still these these. Uh, there's outrage and these outcries of, oh, it's not true. Um, but yeah, so, and I think that that's a testament to its failure. If the science is accurate, people will pursue the science, um, true scientists at least. Uh, I don't think any scientist is worth his salt. Even, well, actually, I should I was about to say, even Jewish Marxists like Stephen Jay Gould. Now, um, you know, most scientists will not uh, deny the validity of things that appear to be manifestly true even if they have a political agenda. I mean, look like Steve, a guy like Steven Pinker, who is, uh, I mean, very Jewish in, in many ways. Um, he still has to grudgingly concede uh, HBD, for example, or sex differences. You know? uh, he wrote a book, The Blank Slate. I mean, it's a very sort of milquetoast refutation of things like the tabula rasa and whatever. But the point being... Um, uh, even people like him, because they scientists want to understand the world, um, even if they do have an agenda. Sometimes that you know that agenda twists things. But uh, so I don't know. The question I guess is, it's, it is political in nature, perhaps. But when, what we do with all this knowledge—that is the ultimate question. Um, it's consequential, but uh, I don't think particularly the left uh, can continue denying these things. And the alt right, of course, alt, alt, alt light rather, is another one of these guys who just who. I mean, you'll get someone like Sargon of Akkad who will maybe concede certain points, but just sort of brush over them or, or just sort of 
Well, yeah, yeah that's all true, but egalitarianism or, or whatever. Um, so, I mean, but I, I think eventually, certainly the alt-light will cave. The alt-light isn't really a political organization or, or a group of people as much as it is a kind of uh, YouTube niche uh, that, that makes money off of a certain trend. So, you know, w once HPD and uh, sex differences become really trendy and the um, Overton window, in the, at least in the, in, in the context of the Internet and YouTube, opens up such that it becomes acceptable to talk about things outside of fringe areas like MGTOW or, or the Manosphere more generally or alt-right or the Reactosphere, I think you'll see at least the alt-light start talking about it. And then uh, I guess the, the left, the actual left, will be the very last ones to have to sort of engage with this, but well, they will eventually. Do you see the Overton window as, as actually continuing to expand to, to include things like this? Absolutely. And uh, it's a rather firm belief because, once again, uh, anything that's based in reality, mm -hmm. if you choose to offer resistance to that, you will run headlong against it and you will, you will injure yourself. I mean, uh, it's... Um, you know, it, it's like setting sail... Well, okay... Uh, they did end up somewhere, but some of these uh, uh, European explorers are setting sail with some idea of a, you know, a cube, a cubicle Earth or something. It's just the wrong idea, um, and eventually they discovered it was. But um, it, it has to because the, the science is just too too potent. I mean, it's already it's already the case. I mean, in despite all of this left uh, the, the political culture, you have you know mass sort of casual genetic testing you know it's pretty minimal in you know, your autosomal dna you can find out your haplotypes and all these surfaces whatever um the more interesting stuff is going into the really individual stuff you know predilection towards disease because that's where you're gonna really find out a lot more all you find out in other tests are just you know maybe where your ancestors came from uh for example uh you know my my paternal haplotype and if you go far enough back i share a an ancestor with you know Joseph Stalin, you know, whatever. But, <laughs> I mean, that's it's kind of anecdotally interesting, but whatever. But I mean, that's an indication um, that yes, uh, the science is ongoing. People are paying money to quote unquote find out about their their genetics, and and most people don't even don't even understand this stuff. They don't understand these genetic distinctions, autosomal population genetics they don't even some of them don't even know the difference between mitochondrial dna and why it doesn't really matter i mean people are doing this stuff so under the noses of, of political correctness this stuff is still uh, occurring and uh, and so this is ongoing and pretty soon you'll be able to get a complete analysis of your genome uh, affordably uh, probably in the next decade or two for a few hundred bucks I, so and, and, and the other things, uh, I've talked about this before, but we'll know in a few short decades which alleles, for example, are most likely, at the very least, correlated and perhaps associated with, with high intelligence. And, and, and uh, you know, there's, there are already inklings of this, you know, that certain populations have certain things and others don't. I mean, the science has become so overwhelming that the left will become, well, they're already the laughing stock in many ways, but... but just, just it'll, it'll. No one will take them seriously. They'll open up their mouths and say, you know, it's all culture and there's no such thing as biological differences and the sexes are the same. And nobody, 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 nobody will listen to them um, because they'll. I guess it'd be a bit like the boy who cried wolf. Yeah. But also just, just because it'll be just very factual and grounded in reality. The real struggle in the future with regards to HPD, and I think there's a hierarchy. I think sex differences are more important to understand than HPD. And then comes HPD, that is the genetic population differences. Because sex differences are, are I mean, this goes back to just the earliest mammalian creatures. Mm -hmm. um, is what to do with that in the end. So, yes, the, the left, quote unquote, will be defeated. or They won't be able to address this stuff. But then what do you do with it? Um, I, I think a lot of it will just be organic. Um, I think people, will just, people tend to react to things the way they react. Um, it is a politicized issue, so you'll have certain tendencies. You'll have sort of left-leaning tendencies and, and right-leaning tendencies, and then uh, maybe a full spectrum, you know, far right, far left. Uh, but everyone will acknowledge this eventually. And uh, so the overturn window for that 
or it's already opening. It's already quite, it's ajar, and it will perhaps open fully, and then the discussion will be, well, what do we do about it? Um, one interesting answer is, well, nothing. Um, I think that that actually might end up being a proposal made by people with um, liberal or, or left-wing sympathies, um, because their implications to some of these things, uh, pol political impl policy implications with regards to affirmative action, uh, the excessive aid women receive in education, etc. You know, um, I think a lot of people might say, well, let's just leave it alone. Even a guy like Sam Harris has gone on record saying, well, I don't understand why it's so uh, important to uh, research and study this stuff, intelligence or racial differences. And, and other people will say, well, this is consequential and we should design policies uh, based on this. I mean, it, it, but nobody will say this doesn't exist. Uh, I mean, uh, I think it's very unlikely. And we'll see this within our lifetimes, that, that aspect of things. So I, I guess that's a positive, depending on how you look at it. I see the left's um, attitude towards immigration or sort of the effort to homogenize all the different populations of the world as an effort to resolve the question of HBD before having to confront the reality of it as sort of making the problem go away by actually eliminating differences between groups of people uh, so they don't have to no, actually... They, they can't. I mean, um, it'd be a nice... Well, I don't know. I don't really have a strong opinion on, on what would be. I like to dwell on reality, but... You know, let's say the left the left wing would be nice if everyone could be made the same. Everyone would get along. There wouldn't be uh, ethnic conflict um, and the various uh, derivative conflicts. You know, religious ethnic conflicts or just religious conflict, etc. Wh whatever in group is the sort of fashion of the day, or uh, the one that people most strongly align themselves with. But I mean, it's kind of um, you have to acknowledge it, that, 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 that people in groups, at least, on, a, on aggregate, behave a certain way, uh, represent their... I, I try to have this discussion uh, oftentimes with an Australian friend of mine, not reactionary, he's another Australian friend, but... Uh, and he, you know, he's another guy who's just very, very individualistic and uh, really no... I mean, he's ultimately of Irish ancestry, but no... I mean, it's years, centuries, no connection to it... It's very hard to explain this. So I can I can be the sort of hyper atomized individual that I am, and acknowledge that there definitely are group tendencies. People act as as a rule in a certain manner. Um, I've lived in South Korea. I see how South Koreans. Uh, I've uh, observed uh, Jewry. Uh, they definitely have uh, distinct traits and mm -hmm. and tendencies. Uh, you know. Africans, Black Americans, Latin, I mean, it's undeniable. And of course, there will always be exceptions. And I'm a person who, I guess it's milquetoast to me, think that we should make some room for exceptions in, in all of this. But as a general rule, observing trends, social trends, and this, this is even more so the case with the Saxis, where the, the differences are even more profound and even more rigid, because you're much more likely to find um, commonality between... You know, uh, a black guy and an Iranian guy, uh, in terms of interests and predilections, than you would be uh, between uh, a male and female of any uh, particular genetic persuasion, just because their reproductive interests are so misaligned in many ways, aligned and misaligned simultaneously, I would say. So it's kind of, but still, I mean, try to make room for exceptions, but ignoring it wholesale, the whole cloth is is uh, is doomed to fail because. We've seen, for example, what happened in uh, in London with uh, with Mayor Khan, the election the mm -hmm. election of the Pakistani gentleman. No, oh, well, sorry, the British Pakistani gentleman. Uh, you know, this would not have been possible 40 years ago without a constituency that supported him. Probably not exclusively Pakistani, uh, many people of color, but people who thought, well, hmm, you know, let's get one of our guys in or some guy who's similar to us. I mean, it's that visceral, I imagine, that some people that aren't even Pakistani say, oh, this guy's kind of got brown skin, I'll go vote for him, you know. He's 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 more similar to me. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think it's it's, uh, it's it's something that, that uh, you have to concede, uh, at least in part. Um, and you have to be able to step out of your own box. I, I, I just don't feel very sort of... I mean, well, I feel very uh, attached to European culture because I spent a long time studying it, but I don't, the sort of, 
the extreme ethnocentrism that is at least allegedly uh, projected on, uh, by, by the alt-right. I don't feel that. But still, I understand where it comes from. Uh, I have no problem, for example, if, if, if pointing out um, certain things uh, because you know it, it's there. It's very difficult to deny. Uh, however, um, you know, the, all of this will become open for discussion as time goes by. As I said, first by the alt-light. Um, the alt-light is kind of a good barometer for what is acceptable because they're very politically correct. By that I mean, of, of course, they, Sargon's called a, a racist and a Nazi, but that's not what I mean. By politically correct, I mean the barometer of what is actually acceptable. Um, you know, recently, for example, in, in a very long three and a half hours, talk mostly about expats. I, I, uh, it got quite serious, and, and uh, ex, uh, expat and I, reaction expat, had a very long, well, it wasn't too long, about a half an hour, a very serious discussion about the JQ in great depth, and we talked about some very potentially unpleasant things. You'll never hear that discussion in the alt light, for example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that that's something that they're good. So once we see the Sargons and the Lauren Southerns and all, you know, the whole gaggle of people uh, begin to discuss these things, at least touch upon them, then we will know that the Overton window has uh, opened further or perhaps completely. Uh, although I guess the complete opening of the Overton window would be uh, essentially the the destruction of the Overton window, the lack of of existence of the Overton window, because uh, by its nature it, it implies limitations in political discussion. I'd say with those two topics, HPD and sex differences, once once you can discuss those openly, there's nothing left that you can't discuss. I would argue that. Um, I would think so. Yeah. Interesting times we're living in. Yeah. Yes, certainly. I agree with all of that. Yeah. In any event, I will thank my guest for his, uh, for his time and his participation. I will also be posting a link uh, both to his channel, that is Kazra TV, and the lengthy discussion he had with Expat. There are a lot of uh, interesting questions that he, uh, he had to field, some of them pretty esoteric, if I recall. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it'll be an interesting channel to watch, whatever your persuasion might be. But certainly uh, different in the sense that he is a Iranian American, <laughs> whatever that means. Right. <laughs> but, well, thanks uh, for having me on. It well, was a pleasure. Uh, a pleasure for me as well. Thank you for joining me. If you liked this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, Please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.